Hello, welcome to Forest Learn. This video is a case study on the electric fields created by electric fish. Such fish are fascinating animals. They use electric fields for detection and navigation and to hunt prey, amongst other things. By trying the four questions in this case study, you can check your understanding of key concepts in electric fields and in the process learn a little bit about how these fish stun their prey. We discuss the solutions to the questions in detail so you can check your answer. So let's take a look at the first question. Electric fish create electric fields around them. The equipotentials around such a fish are drawn in the diagram on the right. Values are in microvolts. A student suggests that the electric field is as strong between points A and B as it is between points C and D. Explain whether this is correct or not. So point A is here, point B is here, point C, point D. And the equipotentials are these black curves here and their values are shown in white here. So please pause the video and have a go at this question yourself. Once you're done, unpause the video and we'll discuss the solution. Okay, welcome back. Most of the time, in questions on electric or gravitational fields, if you're given a diagram representing the field, the diagram will show field lines. In contrast, the diagram in the question is only showing equipotentials, the black curves drawn around the fish. Remember that an equipotential is a line or surface joining points of constant potential. For our purposes, because we're talking about electric fields, potential here refers to electric potential. So for example, all the points on this curve here, which includes points A and C, have the same value of potential, namely 250 microvolts. So how are we to figure out whether the electric field is as strong between points A and B as it is between points C and D. The key is to remember the fundamental relationship between electric field strength and electric potential, namely that the electric field strength is equal to the potential gradient, which is what this formula here is saying. So E stands for the electric field strength between two points, V is the electric potential, and so delta V stands for the potential difference between two points, and delta R is the distance between those two points. And the potential gradient is the potential difference divided by the distance between the two points. A couple of things to note are often you'll see a minus sign in front of the potential gradient here, and strictly that is needed, although it's not important for our purposes. Really the minus sign tells us something about the direction of the field strength, so we don't really need to worry about that too much in this question. The other thing to note is that you might not even be too familiar with this relationship between field strength and potential gradient. You might not even recognize it from a formula sheet and it might not even actually be on the formula sheet for the exam board you're doing. But it is in the spec, so it is something you need to know. For instance, the last time I checked, it's not printed on the Edexcel formula sheet. So to work out the field strength between A and B, call it EAB, we need to divide the change in potential or the potential difference between those points by the distance between the points. Similarly, we can say that the electric field strength between points C and D is given by the potential difference between C and D divided by the distance separating those two points. Now, since the potential at B and D is 500 microvolts, because they both lie on this equipotential, this common equipotential here, and the potential at A and C, as we've discussed before, is 250 microvolts, what this means is that both these potential differences between A, B and C, D are equal to 250 microvolts. But the difference is that the separation between C and D is clearly greater than the separation or the distance between points A and B, as you can see from the diagram. So what this implies is that the electric field strength between A and B will be greater than the electric field strength between points C and D. And so the student is wrong in their suggestion. Let me also just point out that these electric field strengths A, B and C, D these are strictly speaking just the average field strength between at these positions between A, B and, C, and between C and D respectively. In reality the electric field strength will be continuously changing between points C and D and between points A and B. So this in a sense just tells you the average electric field strength. Alright, so let's now move on to question two. 
A small negative charge is placed at point P at rest. Describe and explain the subsequent motion of the charge and any energy transfers that take place. Neglect resistive forces. So you can see point P here and we're dealing with the same electric field around the electric fish as in question one. So please pause the video here and have a go at this question by yourself and when you're done unpause the video and we'll talk about the solution. Okay welcome back. In the previous question we saw that the potential gradient lets us work out the magnitude of the electric field strength. But field strength is a vector quantity. It has direction and magnitude. While we didn't need to discuss the direction of the field strength previously, it is important here in order to figure out the motion of the charge. An important principle in both electric and gravitational fields is that the field lines and equipotentials cross or intersect at 90 degrees. For example, in the case of a uniform electric field where the field lines are depicted by these white straight lines directed to the right, you can see that the equipotentials at 10 volts, 5 volts and 0 volts cross or intersect at 90 degrees to the field lines. Therefore, at point P, we know that the field line should be drawn perpendicular to the equipotential as drawn here. This still leaves open the question of what the direction of the field line should be. Should it be to the left or to the right? We can figure this out by looking at the uniform field once again. Notice that the direction of the field lines is in the direction of decreasing electric potential. So as we move from left to right, the potential goes from 10 to 5 to 0 volts and the field lines are directed towards the right so in the direction in which the potential decreases. So this turns out to be another general important concept that the field lines point in the direction of decreasing potential. Now from this we can see that at point P the field line must be directed to the right since that's the direction in which the potential is decreasing. So over here this equipotential is at 100 microvolts, point P is at 0 microvolts and if we move to the right we end up on this equipotential which is at minus 100 microvolts. This means that the negative charge will experience an electrostatic force to the left and therefore accelerate to the left. Remember that the direction of electric field lines indicate the direction of the electrostatic force on a positive charge. So had we placed a positive charge at point P it would accelerate to the right but a negative charge will accelerate to the left. As the negative charge accelerates, its kinetic energy will increase, and so there must be an equal decrease in its electrical potential energy store. In other words, there's a transfer from electric potential energy to kinetic energy. Now let's move on to the next question. Suggest what can be deduced regarding the electric charges inside the fish. Once again, please pause the video and have a think about this by yourself. When you're done, unpause the video and we'll discuss the solution. Okay, welcome back. The key to answering this question is to realize that the equipotentials and field lines give us information about the electric charges present inside the fish. We already have the equipotentials, so let's try and figure out the field lines. If we draw in a few field lines, they'll look something like this. Notice that they intersect equipotentials at 90 degrees and point in the direction of decreasing electric potential as required by the two important concepts we met earlier. What we see is that there are field lines starting from the left end of the fish and other field lines converging or finishing up on the right end of the fish. Just like field lines point outwards from a single positive point charge and are directed towards a single negative point charge, we have to conclude that there is positive charge located at the left end of the fish and that there is negative charge located at the right end. Due to the asymmetry of the field lines and equipotentials, the positive charge will actually be spread out a bit more and the negative charge will be a bit more concentrated. But that's not something you need to worry about too much. Now you might recall from the beginning of the video that I mentioned that in this case study you'd learn a little bit about how electric fish stun their prey. So what happens when these fish encounter relatively large prey is that they first bite their prey and then they wrap themselves around the prey, something like this. So what that does is that the positive and negative charges at the ends of the electric fish are now across or on the opposite sides of their prey 
resulting in a relatively strong electric field across the prey, which results in an electric discharge, which is enough to paralyze the prey. So this is a little bit simplified. If you're curious to know a bit more, you can find some links in the description where you can learn more about what actually goes on. But this is the basic process behind which electric fish capture larger prey. All right, so let's now move on to the fourth and final question in this case study. A student suggests that the electric field created by the fish is a radial field. Explain whether this is correct or not. As usual, please pause the video and have a think about this by yourself. When you're done, unpause it and we'll discuss the solution. Okay, welcome back. To start, I think it's useful if we bring back in the field lines that we drew already from question 3. And it turns out that in question 3, we already saw some radial fields, although we didn't actually call them radial fields. So the fields created by a single positive point charge or a single negative point charge are radial fields. And if you just compare these two field patterns to the field lines, the electric field due to the fish, it's absolutely clear that the electric field due to the fish is not a radial field. So just to make the point clear, a radial field is due to a single point charge. So a single point positive charge or a single point negative charge. The field due to the fish is therefore not radial because as we've discussed, there's positive charge at, at the left end and negative charge at the right end. A common misconception I find with students is that they often think that in gravitational and electric fields that fields can either be uniform or radial and that there's no other option. In reality, uniform and radial fields are the simplest types of fields. Most realistic fields are neither of those and this is an example of that. If you found this video useful, please like it, share it, subscribe to the Forest Learn channel if you haven't already and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you soon.